Okay, so um, I would like to welcome you all to the colloquium, and uh, I would like you to also make sure you go back and tell your groups that colloquium is an important tradition that we are establishing here at, uh, at NCSA, and it's new, so, uh, it's, but it's an important event that I really hope everyone will try to attend every week. Um, and in fact, we have great speakers from around the world, and today we have uh, Dieter Kronzelmuller from, um, from southern Germany, although He's Austrian, and in fact, he has his PhD from uh, the University of Linz in computer science, and he's currently a, a, a professor, full professor of computer science at the University of Munich, uh, and he's also the director of the Leibniz Supercomputer Center, LRZ, as you also may know it. Uh, I've known Dieter for, I don't know, for at least 15 years, I guess. I, I'm trying to remember where we knew each other, but when I lived in Germany, we interacted quite a lot in those days around, I think, grid computing was perhaps one of the areas, and so Dieter's been very active in computational science, uh, in visualization, virtual reality, uh, high-performance computing, grid computing, uh, and so he'll be talking today about things that are very much of interest to, to this audience and, in fact, to many of the, the uh, people that we work with around the, the country and around the world. Dieter is also um, uh, the German representative on the European Grid Initiative and uh, has... Um, done a lot of work in uh, supporting user communities as well as the director of the center. So I'd like to have you all welcome Dieter. Glad to have you here. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. I can tell you where we met. And that was actually an interesting story. <laughs> I was a student uh -oh. and uh, I was organizing together with some other people a workshop. And I thought, we need a, a famous keynote speaker. Yeah? And we came very early to your name, yeah? And we said, well, we can try, but he would never have time, I mean. And I sent you an email at that time and said, would you have, be able for a keynote? And, and, and you replied, yes, of course, I'm available at that day. And I was completely flattened out, yeah? The other thing is also when I came in here today, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I mean, this is a story, this is almost on the day, 20 years ago, I installed the first CERN uh, web server on my place, and you needed a browser, so I downloaded NCSA's Mosaic, yeah? And today when I came in, I saw the old logo somewhere outside the door. I was really, I mean, this is great here. Thanks for allowing me to come here, yeah? And I didn't come from Austria or Germany, I came from Sao Paulo, Brazil, so this is the end of my stop, and usually you keep the, the highlight for the end. So what I'm talking today about is, is something that we are doing, energy efficiency and extreme scaling. Well, that's two buzzwords in a sense, and I'll try to put them in, in the title of a talk, and that's it. My team is, is centered around these four groups that you see here. You have the Leibniz Supercomputing Center in the top uh, over here. This is the, 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 the cube that you mentioned in the talk earlier. You have the Technical University of Munich, you have the Ludwig Maximilians University, or the so-called University of Munich, and you have the University of Armed Forces. And the Munich Network Management Team, my group, is basically at all these locations. And there is about 14 kilometers in between here and about six kilometers in between here. So it's the area of Munich, basically. And as you correctly said, it's southern Germany. Bavarians would never say southern Germany. It's Bavaria, and then there is Germany. Yeah? so to say. So it's very important to keep that. And if you take a look at my research, then the topic grid computing is still very much relevant. I'm still doing that in a sense, but I've also been active in the area of networks and then going to clouds, of course, and then in the end, the high-performance computing machines. What you see here is a picture of our old SGI uh, origin that we had, and I'm also proud to say I, I looked that up the group that had the biggest allocation here was the group in Potsdam, where you were. So you were the power user on our machine at that time, which is I an interesting coincidence, <laughs> no? I wish I were still doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so that goes to the, say, kind. these are the pillars, and then I have some cross topics. Like virtualization is a cross topic that is relevant in all these areas. Service management, relevant in all these areas. And then I have a small group doing, dealing with IT security. That's the research, and again, I should say I'm the university professor that does the research, that we do research on any topic, whether it's successful or not, and I'm also the director, or one of the four directors of the Leibniz Supercomputing Center, which is these four buildings in front. 
So what you have seen in 2006 was basically this cube and this building and this building. And we added this one, this one, and the second cube here. Yeah? So in total what we have is we have here about 10,000 square meters of area, which is 150,000 square feet, if I did the computation correctly, on five floors or six floors if you also count the rooftop. You see on the rooftop the cooling equipment. And then we, here we have the office space. And the office space is basically where we have all the, the, uh, the people working for the center. So in total, we have about uh, 200 people, so if it put together, so it means 156 plus student employees, yeah? Like for the 24-hour operation during night shifts, that's one of the most preferred student jobs, yeah? If something is happening, it's usually interesting because there's a crisis. If nothing is happening, they can do other useful things and they are at a very good network connected hub, yeah, so to say. So we have these office spaces, that's the two buildings. We also have here virtual reality and visualization center, I'll come to that later. And we have something comparable to what you have here with the lecture room building where we do our events. So if we take our tasks, then first of all, we are the computer center for the Munich universities. That means, as I said, we have at least three universities. The armed forces is a federal university, so take the two Munich universities, which is the University of Munich and the Technical University. And if you take the rankings, or international or national, it's always these two universities in front in, in, in the rankings that we have in Germany. So for the two universities, we are providing the standard services, starting from exchange, doing groupware, whatever. We also have special equipment that they can just use for their daily work. And we provide things like the help desk, we provide courses on, on different topics, whatever you would imagine. So it's standard computing service provisioning, and that includes the network, for instance, we're doing the Munich Research Network, and for the Munich Research Networks, basically from here, from our center, you go to the world, and you go also to places like uh, on top of the highest mountain in Germany where there's the research station uh, that is connected to the researchers, to the university via our network. So in total, we have about 4,600 kilometers of cable which are being adjusted by a team of experts that, that's taking care of that. That is one of the services. Now, if we go a little bit further, we are also the, the, the Bavarian Computer Center. Bavaria itself has about 10 million inhabitants and you know some things of Bavaria like BMW and Audi uh, coming from there, so there's also lots of industry there. And the center itself is a regional computer center which provides clusters on the state level, in a sense. Yeah? We also have the uh, virtual reality center that you see here. Well, that's a room 12 by 12 meters, and also the height is 12 meters, where we have a power wall with 650 uh, times 3 meters, and uh, a cave in there, which is also kind of an equipment on a state level. So anybody from Bavaria that wants to use it can use it, and you would see even archaeologists coming in and visualizing a tomb or something, whatever you want to see there. So, and the last thing, oh, here are some examples, yeah, forgot to mention that, like different areas, uh, flooding, or what you also see here in, is the last part, this is an a thing where you do city planning, for instance, yeah? They're just using that, they're using their state organization, that's why they can get in. And the last part is we're also the National Supercomputing Center. So in Germany, there are three National Supercomputing Center, that's Jülich, Stuttgart, and ourselves, and basically they together provide on a national and with federal money, the supercomputing capability. And this is called the Gauss Center for Supercomputing, and you see some of the three machines here, and I mentioned the three institutions, and this is more like an association between us, yeah? So the association has been funded, and I know that this is recorded, but in its effect, in a sense, to also make sure that Germany invests in supercomputing, yeah? And that's why these three centers are working together, and we are, as you see on the last line there, one of the hosting members of PRAISE, so if you talk about our center, and Gabriel specifically asked also for that to explain how that works in Europe, well, praise is something like the exceed of Europe. So it's a combination of all the European supercomputing center making sure that users in Europe can 
use this hardware uh, infrastructures. And that if you put that in, basically it means the top of the pyramid, these three centers, which are the national leading centers, are also the ones which are providing the European leadership computing. Sorry for the German slide in here, but that's basically one which we are always using there. And the other point is, of course, if you talk about praise, you should also discuss that typically in Europe, I'm not sure if, if that's for exceed, but I'm looking forward to discuss with John later. Um, in Europe, you need, of course, the legal framework. You need to establish an organization. You need to make sure that there's some sustainability. You need to make sure that many European countries are happy with that. So there's lots of overhead to make sure that that comes in. And this praise has been established comparably, again, to, to exceed on a five-year basis from 2010 to 2015, with 400 million euros coming in from France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, and providing the tier zero centers. So in Germany, we are part of this tier zero center that puts in 400 million, and the 400 million is what Germany is investing in this supercomputing uh, hardware. And from the 400 million, about 200, about 50%, exactly 50% is coming from the individual states. So there is also a part from Bavaria in there that makes sure that our center is part of this national initiative, uh, so to say. And then there are these other centers which are providing in some money also to provide uh, this application support. So if we put it together, these are all the machines which are in praise around. The uh, slide is about uh, six months old, so there is, of course, changes going on. And you have all these different systems with the different capabilities. You apply for a job there uh, in terms similar to here. You kind of submit a, a proposal. You get that in. The proposal is being uh, evaluated. And then here is one call, the first call that they had, the early access call. Uh, you get some allocation, and then you can run on any of the systems in Europe. Yeah? It always depends, of course, what you want, and we'll get later, later to what our system is being about. Of course, there's a call every six months, and basically you can always try to get some allocation for your system. And I've just got an email that one of my uh, own allocations running out today because that project is basically at the end of its lifetime. Uh, you have also another example here where who is uh, submitting a proposal in that call? We had uh, a German scientist who could come to the German part of our machine. He could also go to the European part of that machine. It always depends, and we see, of course, also many combinations of what's going on. So if we put our roles together, then what we have is all these four layers where we provide the services to our users, and that is also reflected in what we see here in our own architecture, Basically, we start from the desktop and we go all the way up to the big machine and we're providing services from users in your own office, in the university's office, on the Bavarian level, on the state level, on the national level, and on the European level. Now, the interesting thing, and you see noted on the top of the pyramid, is the name of our machine that's called SuperMUK. If you ever fly from here to Munich, the airport is called MUK, and this is the SuperMUK, that's where the name comes from. Uh, don't ask me, there was a competition about that, yeah? But uh, that's how people come up with names. The interesting thing is that SuperMOOC is an x86 architecture. So whatever you have here on your desktop, basically, <coughs> goes up all the way with the same system to SuperMOOC. And that's how you also have to qualify. You have to demonstrate that your application scales up on a, on a smaller cluster before you get access to the big machine, in a sense, yeah? And SuperMOOC is also 100% at the moment x86. So there's no accelerator in there, there's no GPU in there. Yeah? Basically, if you want to use the system, it's x86 pure, and that has some certain characteristics on the system. Now let us take a look at SuperMOOC. What you see here is half of the machine room, uh, half of the machine room meaning 600 square meters, so the machine room has about uh, 1,200 square meters, and this is phase one of SuperMOOC with 3.2 petaflop peak performance and uh, combined from 18 islands. You see here on top yellow, this is the InfiniBand interconnect. Uh, you see in front a little bit the, uh, the hard disk section in a sense, and the rest is really these 18 islands connected to do the computation. What you do not see here is, well, you see the height of the room, 
until the double floor. The double floor here for the system is one meter eighty. And politically incorrect, I always say we only hire administrators which are smaller than 180 because they can work on, uh, in, the, in the double floor. Reason is, of course, we need the space below for all the water cooling and for the electricity. So that's on the floor below, so we can go in and do tours in there. We just had an open day. We had 1,200 visitors which were basically channeled through the system, which was interesting for the visitor because, of course, has some uh, consequences for us in terms of cleaning up. Uh, and then, of course, this is the slide which we discussed that before. I, I left it in. Yeah, I know that Blue Waters is not on the list, but of course, for the politicians, it was important to see, oh, there's a Bavarian machine on, on, on position four. Yeah? Don't ask me where it is now. I have no idea. Yeah? It must be somewhere in top 15. I couldn't care less. As I said, the, the matter of success is for me when people are using the system to do their research. Yeah? And as long as nobody kind of computes how much value we get from finding a new medical treatment uh, compared to the money we spend on the system, I think there is out of question whatever position you are in the top 500. For us in Bavaria, this is more important. It's basically this slide where we try to discuss with our administration that we always need to have a system that is somehow along the line because that line shows the kind of improvement we have or the kind of need we have in computing in Bavaria. In a sense, going up here and you see it's a uh, exponential line basically going up and you see always we got systems which are trying whenever they were ordered to be along that line. Yeah? Difficulties, of course, you see that the red bars are the computing performance and the yellow is for the storage. And we see that this is much more deviating. Yeah? And I'm not sure that this is really a, a good sign to see, but uh, basically we also have to adapt to the, to the financial and some other burdens that we come up later. One is, for instance, also the power consumption. So the next system, and that's what the people are currently working on, it should have been delivered by the end of the year, but I'm sure you are aware of some of the difficulties with Haswell. So that's the second phase of SuperMOOC. And interesting enough, just in these two years between first phase and the second phase, the same computing power that we had half of the room is now only two rec uh, rows anymore, uh, which is always a fantastic thing to show here around. So this is being installed and we hope to have it running by the beginning of next year sometimes. Now let's come to a little bit more to the point on the energy efficiency. We talked here, I understand, that your energy costs are about one-fourth of what we have. So 20, you're only spending 25% on the same electric energy that we are spending. So right now we have costs of about 18 cents, 18 euro cents per kilowatt hour. That is what we put in. So any hour we, we, we spend about 1,000 euros just on the power of the running the system or running the, the, the building in a sense, yeah? The other tragic thing is, of course, if we, we are using warm water cooling for the system. I'll come to that in a second. The, the generated heat, we're using the generated heat for heating our own building, but we are only using less than 1% of the heat. Yeah? The rest goes into the Munich air. And there is very, it's very hard to kind of connect other buildings to that yeah? because we only have the system for five years. We don't know what the next year is coming up. Yeah? The, the buildings are, is, a, is a state and federal building compared to heating, which is a local community effort in a sense. Yeah? So many of these interesting things. But let's talk a little bit more even if you just take a look at the systems. These are the predecessor. That was uh, HLRB1, one of the systems. I'm sure you also had an allocation on that one, which was just in dimension. Just take one parameter, 8 by 10 meters. And we say that these systems are growing. This was the next system, which was double the, the, the floor space. And then if we go to super smoke, we have again increased. Truth is actually, with every of these systems, we built a new building. And the first thing that happened when we inaugurated the system was that the minister asked, so where are we building the next building for your next machine? Yeah? And that's also a thing that doesn't scale. There is an end to that. And, uh, We'll see that also in a second. So the building by itself is interesting, of course, yeah? Just the sheer size is 10,000 square meters or 115,000 square meters, that's the size. 
And you see that we also had the difficulty that in this part of the building, we were running the last supercomputer while they're building the new building for the next supercomputer at the same time. And at one point, we had to kind of remove the wall where the other supercomputing was, uh, machine was still running. So that was also very interesting uh, if that works. Now what you also see here is our limitation in a sense. We had these uh, two cubes which are being built one next to each other. And what you don't see here is, but this one is one meter smaller. And the question is, why do you build something not identical with the previous one? Well, actually, there's a beaver living here, and the Green Party has very much protested against us removing the beaver. So we had to lose a couple of square meters for a beaver living here. Uh, don't ask me about opinions. You see that a little bit clear, clearer here? So it's really about one meter that we lose here. Uh, for the Bieber for the second phase. Also, the white part of the building was constructed in 2006, and we had to do the extension in 2010 because we could fit neither in the machine nor the people running the systems. Yeah? We needed 50 more offices or 50 more workspaces, so to say. So that all comes up to the tape that we, that we have here. We have the systems. We are increasing in performance, which is incredible, of course, but we're also increasing in course on what we're running on the system. And every time you talk to people, so whether it's here or here, you hear, no, we don't have any users that will ever make use of the full system anymore. Yeah? We don't need that many cores. Yeah? We need to think about different architecture, whatever it is. And if you talk about the architecture, well, that's what we ended up. We have these thin islands, 18 of them. We have a fat island, different architectures. I'm not going into detail here, but basically, that's the point really where you come up, you did invent something, you don't believe you are there and you don't know how the system will be full. So the previous system compared to the current system, well, if you just take the power consumption, the SGI needed one megawatt and now we need about 2.5, 2.2, something in regular operations. So at most we need three times more power for the, for the more powerful machine, but we have 70 times more performance. It took us exactly two months. I'm sure your experience must be similar. It took us two months where this, until the system was full, and it's full ever since. Yeah? So getting into operation, running up, and then the system is full. What does that tell you? Of course, you also have this other problem. I mentioned the power consumption. And you see power is always going up. And the difficult thing is we don't get a single euro more from the state government for power. So we had to do some other things. So in our procurement for SuperMOOC, this part of the power was included in the procurement. So we basically took some of the first phase of SuperMOOC was 80 million euros. Some of these 80 million euros were spent on the power of the system. So you would need how much power your system is needing when it is operating finally, yeah? which was basically the gamble that IBM took at that time. But that was an interesting experience for us all. And then there is this other thing, very strange, between 2009 and 2010, the power consumption didn't increase. And that was the year when nobody worked at LSF, yeah? So we had bigger vacation. No, truth is, of course, what we did is, we changed from air cooling to water cooling. We increased still the capacity and the capability, yeah? But the power consumption remained the same. Now let's talk a little bit about the power consumption or the cooling, rather. What you see here is the empty room before SuperMOOC came in, and here is basically the connector for the warm water cooling. You also have the, the cooling cycle inside the system. Basically, that's where the, the water is being cooled inside the system, and it's special water, regular water would be too thick. I'm sure you have similar requirements here. You also see from the cabinets what has been done. You have to each of the uh, processes, in principle, you have this, power, uh, this water connector inlet and outlet that you have in there. Yeah? And then you have to think about what if you have some water leaking out. And you can also take a look at the, at the board, basically. You see that the memory and the processes are being cooled throughout the system. And you have here the two water connectors. And you can remove each of them. So this was specifically built for our system with the Xeonx course that we had here. But you also have to take care of the environment. And that makes it funny because 
The system, when it's empty, it uses one megawatt, as I said before. Yeah? If you are running regular operations, you are somewhere around two megawatts, 2.2 maybe. Yeah? If you're running benchmarks, you go up to three, 3.5 megawatts. So starting up Linfec goes very quickly. We need lots of these tons around here at strategical points in the building to make sure that there is cooling wick liquid when you have this power shift yeah, that goes up there. And you see that on the next slide. So all of that here and a large portion, actually it's one floor which we need just to make sure that this one is being circulated. And then you also need the roof where they, the heat is being evaporated to the, the outside air in a sense. Yeah? So we need more space already. We need twice more space for running the system than for the system itself, which is also an interesting part. And what you see on that slide is what happens when you start up Linfec in a sense. Yeah? So we start with the operating system, and then within seconds, you increase the power consumption and the heat production in a sense. Yeah? And you need immediately the cooling fluid to make sure that your system is still operational. So many of these things are interesting, of course, and then once it goes down, you need to do the opposite. Now what happened in our case is that nobody ever built such a system, of course, same as in your case, and we had the, the problem that for the first six weeks, the system was too slow to react. So we had a human being there watching SuperMOOC operating, and once it got warmer, then the human being basically turned up to have more cool water flowing through the system. A couple of interesting things that come up. And of course, what we see here is not only for the benchmarks, but it's for every application. We're trying to run every application with the clock frequency optimal for that application. And we have hundreds of applications running on the system. So each of them basically instructs load leveler, the scheduler, to use the right clock frequency for that particular application. And as I said before, we can also adjust to make sure that we're within the band by giving some outside triggering on what clock frequency to use for the day. So this is interesting from that part of sense. But we haven't talked about things like what is the application mix. As I said, we are using x86 architecture, and what you have here is a very huge mix of different applications that we have there. So we have many different domains which are using it with different software being executed on the system. And like for climate, we are also being used as an overflow center, kind of, when the other center, when the German Climate Research Center needs more cycles, they can also apply for cycles here. We also have, of course, the astrophysics community still there, still running strong and using much of that. And yes, you know, this is also part of the Excellency Initiative in Munich. Now, the problem is, of course, how many of these applications would make use of the full systems? Or how many of these applications would still be happy if you would give them smaller clusters? We think there is enough of these, say, applications there who would need full systems because they want to use them for the scientific breakthrough. And that's why we are building these systems. But we also did a small initiative. We started with the LSZ Extreme Scale Workshop, which is basically the idea that we use some VIP users. So we invited 15 international projects on our system and asked them, uh, well, if you are running, running on 32,000 cores, could we scale your codes up to more than, than these four islands? Could we get you up to uh, at least double the cores or even the full system? So the groups, I mean, I mentioned here, I'm sure you know some of these uh, acronyms, if not all of them. And we said success is if we get you really up to twice the number of cores that you had before with your system. So uh, if that would happen, you would also get a paper into the Parker Conference proceedings. That's kind of an additional incentive. There's more to the incentives. I think it works only with the incentives. So the other incentive is regular SuperMOOC operation means maximum you get is these four islands. Yeah? That was an, an observation we had from the system, and the batch scattering system uh, does make sure that these four islands are available. Now, if you would participate in that challenge, we would give you basically 2.5 days of VIP access to SuperMOOC. Yeah? That means you get half a day for testing, which is not account, nothing of that is accounted to your own 
a budget of cycles, yeah? You get two days for executing the code, well, all of them together. That, that was the only shared thing. And for the first version, we had 16 of the 19 islands available, yeah? Of course, there has to be some kind of other things still going on. We also changed that later on. But basically, what our users got is, within one hour of runtime, they could, could get 130,000 CPU hours. Well, actually, on the f two and a half days, they could get more than the maximum allocation is on the system anyway. Yeah? So that was an incentive also to participate there to do these large extra runs. And as I said, they were not accounted to the total budget. So the result is displayed here. So these were the, the successful projects in a sense. We also compare it to LINPEC, to the top 500 benchmark, which, as you see here, uh, if we are using 16 islands, then the peak performance of the system would be somewhere about 2.6, 2.7 petaflops. So with LINPEC, we get close to what the peak performance of the system is. Yeah? And that also shows you why LINPEC is not so uh, much a capture of reality, because the best codes get only about 1% of what LINPEC, 10% uh, of what LINPEC is doing. Yeah? So from the 2.6 petaflops peak, we got only for the best code we had here, which was plasma physics, running on 128,000 cores, we got about 245 uh, teraflops of performance. And that's reality. And that's what we are talking about. That's what is going on every day, yeah? Not the other numbers which are artificial here. It goes even further down, and you see some of the codes could only scale up to six, uh, 64,000 cores. We also see here difference in, in the MPI, and we also had noticed differences in using OpenMP and MPI combinations. So for us, it was really also to help us with our experiences, and we learned a lot from them, also in terms of the scaling what we had here on both sides. So i just take a look at SISOL here, which is the geophysics code, uh, seismology code, in a sense, 64,000 cores. We had about uh, 100 teraflops on the 2.6 pet, uh, petaflop system, yeah? And I'll come back to that in, in a second. So what we had is basically five software packages were running on a maximum of 16 islands, and we got about 10% of the peak performance, uh, basically showing these graphs. I don't want to go into details in the interest of time, but the important thing here is, what are the lessons learned? Well, technically, we learned a lot of things. Uh, we had some difficulties with OpenMP, and in the first observation, it looked as if MPI plus OpenMP would be slower than pure MPI. Eh? Interesting enough, on the next workshop, we found out what the problem is, and with all the help we got from IBM and Intel, uh, we were better in doing that. The core pinning that we used also for some of the applications, because we believed it would help, was way too much for the average programmer. Yeah? You would consider that they are all exports. But we saw during the workshop it was way too hard for them to do that. Yeah? So the, that was also one interesting experience for us. And then, of course, parallel I.O. was one of the major challenges of our system, basically also with the stability. So really putting all the data back to the disk uh, was too hard for the background system we had uh, with thousands of files into a single directory and so on. So we also had to work on strategies. So, for all the people in the room, especially for the experts, I would say, say this is typical in Austria, we say no na, meaning uh, obvious, that's obvious. Yeah? But think of your users, they wouldn't think of that. Yeah? And for them it was a chance to make this experience together with us and kind of also motivating. So what we did is we put the codes together and say this is our extreme scale benchmark suite, which we'll also use on the next procurement but that is very useful for us, of course. And we also give these successful teams, they keep their VIP status. If we do maintenance and they made improvements of the code, then in the maintenance they could also use the full system in contrast to what we have. We also did a second extreme scaling workshop where we went up to the full 18 islands and uh, basically we also saw codes running on the full 18 islands with four hours of protection runs or seven hours of protection runs. And you immediately notice that, of course, there is also some stability issue here with the mean time between failure and 155,000 cores for that runtime, for instance, yeah? which is, again, something that helps us to understand the system even better. And in the end, we had 
four existing plus six additional full system applications. So at this point in time, with just these two workshops, we had 12 applications which are running the system in full size, and they are making science running the system in full size, which is a justification for us to build these systems, yeah? which is also important for the next one. And then, of course, we also see that one of the things that came up, we could improve the system by itself, or at least understand that we are far away from what we believe that the system would deliver once we are doing real operations there. Well, and then uh, there are other things like the, uh, minimizing the energy runtime, of course. So the result of that is also part of what we call the LSF Partnership Initiative, PICS, and that comes to what I think you call science teams, which is more or less a more personalized way of supporting our users. Yeah? So even these power users, which know what they are doing, which have more experience than the average user, they could benefit from us kind of taking them by the hand and putting them forward on the system. And we saw that here. So at this point in time, we know that we're doing, we're going to repeat this exercise. So the next extreme scale workshop will probably happen in September next year. And the idea is more or less that at that point in time, uh, we have the additional system already in production. And then with the 240,000 cores, we can of course think a little bit more about what we're doing. Uh, here's more of an explanation of what it is. This individual ser services for selected scientific groups. These are the flagships which we think can push science ahead and also make the, the uh, dedicated impact. I hear you have this dedicated point of contact. I think that's very important. We also had that in here. Uh, we have this guidance. We also do targeted training in education. I did that myself. So I said, for one of these events, I want to go there. It was a nice event in the, in the mountains. Um, that's the, one of these Italian values comes back. You, you certainly know that you can do nice skiing up there. And it was one of these resources up there. They had the hydrometrological group, students, basically postdocs, working on these codes. And the first funny thing for me, or funny, uh, take that under quotes, the first interesting thing was they have never heard that a thing like praise exists, or that there are these supercomputer machines where the average postdoc could just submit a proposal to get code and get access to. Eh? These were students from Europe, postdocs at that point in time. Yeah? So I took the chance and took one day out of the entire workshop series, and I gave them an introduction how to get access to our system, what these systems are, what you need to learn in order to use this system, and it was also really interesting for me to see their feedback. We also had other things like uh, specific optimized IT infrastructures. We talked about that before. I think HPC is one part of the equation. You also need storage. You also need the, uh, the network in between. And we need to put that together in, in a sense. And once you are part of this PICS, these points of contact can also go to the network part and say, we need to have this dedicated line between these two supercomputers because we have allocations, both of them, we want to combine them. Huh? We give them early access and we also ask them, what are your needs? So one of the questions we always pose to the users, I don't want to know what you are computing today. I want to know what you want to compute in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. Yeah? Because that's what we are planning on. We just secured the funding for the next uh, version, for the next machine after SuperMOOC phase two which will come in 1718. And we all know that there is no idea what the processor capability will be in 18. But we're already thinking about what happens past 18. What will be the system afterwards, yeah? So we also need them to start thinking about what they could do, what would be the scientific needs for that area. And then, of course, you have also these network of expertise. And I think we're also doing there are some things where these Groups working in PyCS are not only computer scientists, but we're also trying to mix them up. Probably not as good as you're doing here with the, with the students, but uh, from a sense, the idea goes in the same direction. What are we expecting from the partners? Well, we hope that our IT experts can work in their groups. So that's why we're also trying to host them in our rooms. This is very difficult uh, because they don't want to travel. That's at least what we hear. Maybe your campus here is, is, is much more advanced than that one. You have an advantage here. Uh, we're also doing projects. So we already submitted a number of projects. 
I would have never thought that I'm on a project that does building safety. But I also didn't think that these guys would need supercomputers. They tell me, well, it's simple for us to simulate building safety for one building, yeah? But in reality, we need it for 5,000 buildings in the center of Vienna, for instance, yeah? Very interesting proposal. And then that runs easily out of what they have in terms of computing power. And then in the end, uh, we want to be, if possible, on joint publications, of course. Yeah? Not only mention that this was calculated in SuperMOOC, but also that the calculation, the computation was important and somebody helped to do that. Uh, understanding the needs and the requirements is, of course, the background, yeah? as I said before, and of course, uh, developing the future services. So if we go a little bit further on that, and I'll make that a little bit quicker because I said most of that. So it's all these different areas where we benefit from it. So doing that is not only a benefit for the user communities, but it's also a benefit for what we get from it. And I wanted to come to exactly these two examples. So here's one example from astrophysics, and this is astrophysics, the world's largest simulation of supersonic comprehensible turbulence. Truth is, I have no idea what that means. Yeah? I'm a computer scientist. This sounds like a nice title, and I'm sure there's a nice paper to that. And Mr. Federat was one that got an allocation our system. And only through dedicated, specialized support, he was able to do <coughs> that and made some scientific breakthrough here, something that advanced himself. Now, bad thing is he left, of course, the University of Munich and got a tenureship professorship somewhere else. Yeah? But that's a good result. And here is the other result which I wanted to mention. That's the Sisal project, yeah? So if you remember, we had about 10%, 100, oh, less than 10%, 100 teraflops on the three petaflop machine during the first LSF Extreme Scale Workshop. Now, that was not the end to the story. We took them by the hand. They got offices in our building, yeah? They did advance on their algorithms, and then in the end, we made it's possible that they have production runs with 1.4 petaflops on the full system, in a sense. Yeah? That would not have been possible be without this intensive care project, in a sense. Yeah? They have 44.5% of peak performance on a production code, which is, I think, a fantastic result of what we got here. And we should also mention that these are the, the guys, Dr. Felt is from Earth and Environmental Sciences, and Michael Bader, who is from the Department of Informatics, he is the algorithmic guy that is working in there. And his entire group is basically located in our building on one floor. Yeah? And that really shows an example of how this collaboration works and how that could be advanced. And I'm, as I said before, I'm, I'm really happy to hear what you're doing. I think we can learn a lot. Uh, you have some interesting ideas. I think that should bring us forward, and I'm coming to the end, and I would say thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. So questions? I just noticed this could, this could be at the time of the year how Munich looks like. It's also with the time shift, this could be an actual picture. I was thinking you need six more of those to make it back into a cube again, so. Um. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask about the plans, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. What I hear is that, that these two examples I mentioned at the end, yeah, they were able to simulate some, some uh, real world behavior or phenomena for the first time by going to that area, yeah. Having the, exactly what you would expect, yeah. You increase the, the, the resolution, in a sense, and once you have this resolution, you can see some phenomena which you couldn't explain before. That's what we hear. But again, it's still, this part is a bit disconnected, yeah? We are happy that the, the, the Sisal example on the previous slide, that's, uh, uh, as far as I understand, in for the Gordon Bell, uh, is one of the finalists for this year. So we are happy about that. That's an achievement which we value highly. But of course, we don't know what the seismologic group. And this in the back is one of these, how do you say, volcanoes, which was the first time simulated in full yeah, at that resolution. And that also gives them some more ideas on, on what's happening. Yeah. They are also, as far as I understand, simulating what if, if when Fukushima happened, yeah, 
they were simulating what was going on and they would kind of work on the probabilities of another earthquake or something. Okay. But it's a good question in a sense, also going back, how, how could we improve what, what they are getting off from there? Yeah. Um, hello, thank you very much for your speech. Um, I noticed, I, I was uh, very impressed by that VR setup that you have with the cave and the power wall. Can you talk about um, how your computing center interacts with those display systems a little? So the, 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 that's a very good question and I raised that in one of the questions to add how, how you're doing that and also in the discussion I had before with, with, with some of your colleagues here. What we have is, is a dedicated group working on that and we were only funded to do that by getting signatures of 21 or 24 academics groups that said we would want to use that. Yeah? And that's completely different in a sense, it's not necessarily HPC. And to tell the truth, in the past we have been much more successful with those groups that are not doing HPC. So like archaeology, um, pedagogic, uh, these kinds of uh, groups which are more disconnected from HPC. For HPC, and that comes to the question where you were asking, uh, we had a discussion last week on how to improve that. Yeah? And the idea is now that similar what we did with scaling up for the course, we also have to kind of take them by the hand and go with them and go in there. There's two points we get out of that. One is, of course, this dissemination and outreach aspects. If we can show beautiful pictures, we can also kind of raise the awareness in the community, uh, impress the outside world. And for the open day, which I mentioned with the 1,200 visitors, we also had full booking for the full day in the virtual reality and visualization center. That's an important aspect. We shouldn't forget that communication with the public about what we are doing is important. Eh? The other point is, of course, we still need to show that this visualization gives us scientific breakthrough. I hear from some of the uh, points that these, uh, the glaciers, glaciology for instance, yeah, they can now visualize that for the first time in animations. They did that before uh, in static pictures, yeah, but now they can also kind of investigate much more. It's very hard for us to understand what the scientific breakthrough is there, yeah, but the that only worked because we really had a person dedicated, sitting in with them, working on them with a project. And that is also the strategy we are doing now. We are hiring a person which is basically going through all the application domains, ask if you need visualization, I'm here, I'm assigned to you for three months. And that comes back to what we discussed also before. You're assigned to a project to help them to work with that. And I think visualization is, at least that's what we hope works, yeah? If you have other experience, I'll, ha I'll be happy to hear that. Yeah. So, uh, about the uh, scaling on the uh, qualifications to use a supermax system, um, you mentioned the uh, core count is a primary measure of uh, proof of scaling. Are there any other requirements uh, that you would that an application needs to pass to prove that it's scaling, or and what kind of follow through do you see after after they meet that measure in terms of actual use? Uh, and how they, how they use the system once they prove that. Mm -hmm. So the, the core count is the most important one we had for that one. The other needs we are, of course, whenever you submit a proposal for the machine, you also have to specify memory requirements, uh, IOMA requirements, these kinds of things, and they have to match in. It's unfortunate, I, I really, one of the slides I removed yesterday was, you could see for the entire praise a range of machines, what are these requirements, yeah? And we have, unfortunately, enough of the users failing because they require, I don't know, just too much memory per core on each of the systems, yeah? But this is getting too complicated, and that's why we have also praise with these different systems, yeah? Where you might fit on that machine, but you certainly don't fit on, on the other, any of the other machines. You could raise a number of important uh, points here. They are checked, so each of these proposals is checked in two phases. One is the technical check, which does all these, does it fit to the machine, yeah? Um, what are the memory requirements, what are the compiler requirements, these kinds of things, yeah? But the, 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 the first measure is kind of, you have to, to be above a certain number of uh, cores and, 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 and below the, the maximum number of cores in between there, yeah? 
But it's a good question. I would also assume that in the future we have energy as an important factor in there. Especially in our case, we are really buying this band of power and getting outside of the band is very expensive, yeah, in a sense. So that, that can, for this run here, for the 1.4 petaflops, we have to kind of make sure that nothing else is running because otherwise we would come out of the, of the, of the power consumption, that thing, yeah? So a couple of things. Thanks. Thank you. I think um, perhaps we, we might have time for another question, but we also have a reception, which I forgot to mention at the beginning. So there is some time uh, for further discussion and maybe uh, some cookies or light snacks. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you in a few minutes out there. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.